I'd like to uh, welcome everybody for the uh, second day of this conference. The first day yesterday was uh, consisted of uh, two very good uh, mini courses uh, uh, <coughs> aimed at uh, mainly uh, graduate students and uh, young researchers. Um, I'm uh, uh, Professor Chuck Newman from a NYU. I'm a co-organizer of the conference with uh, Professor Xiao Shiman from uh, uh, Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, and uh, I guess there are a few people who, who weren't here yesterday, so we, we welcome you in particular. Uh, the chair of this morning's uh, session will be Professor Michael Cranston from the University of California at Irvine. Ah, I should have said that I'm from NYU and also from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, I'm going to discuss that at lunch. <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so the, 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 there were some changes from the original program that were uh, uh, too late to get put printed. Uh, and so today, this is uh, uh, the, the main change. Uh, that's right, but uh, that's not what it says. In <laughs> yes, that was originally well, that was supposed to be the case. Um, then there, then there's some changes uh, at, at, at tomorrow. Uh, um, uh, let's, let's not talk about those now. So, uh, we'll give this to, uh, talks this morning before a break. Uh, first is. Non, uh, predictability in non-equilibrium discrete spin dynamics, given by Professor Dan Stein from NYU. And uh, well, there's much more information up there than I will give. Uh, so I hand over the floor to you, Dan. Very nice to be uh, back here in Shanghai. Um, the talk I'm going to give today, uh, I want to first acknowledge my collaborators. I'm Chuck Morgan, and that's a mistake. It should say NYU New York, NYU Shanghai, and University of California Irvine. Did I miss anything? <laughs> uh, Jean Yi, who was a, uh, an undergraduate student of ours, who's now a graduate student at Princeton, and John Macta, <coughs> excuse me, who's at UMass Amherst. And, um, the work, this work is actually something that's inspired by a physics problem, but it's of equal interest, I think, in both physics and mathematics, the cold mechanics. It tends to be an equilibrium uh, problem. But this is a problem that is very far from equilibrium. It refers to something called a deep quench. When you take a material at extremely high temperature and you very rapidly cool it to a very low temperature. Um, this has several names uh, in the physics literature. Uh, uh, it's sometimes called spinodal uh, decomposition. It's sometimes called coarsening. It's sometimes called uh, phase kinetics. It has all kinds of different names. And the origins of it are in metallurgy, where very often uh, when you make a metal, you very often have to cool from, you know, especially metallic glasses, but other metals as well, from a very high to very low temperature rapidly. That's a Procedure known as quenching is the opposite of what's known as annealing, which you may have heard from, where you tend to change and lower the temperature more slowly, uh, keeping the system more or less in equilibrium, which is useful for harder. That's the physics uh, aspect of the problem. But as we'll see, it has some very interesting mathematics associated with it. So for me, uh, this is an ideal problem because it has, let me begin by, uh, uh, telling you, uh, giving you a, a description of the problem. Um, is it okay if I use my biological pointer as opposed to this one? Um, so let's first consider a, uh, a configuration of variables on the lattice ZD. And these variables, that's all right. These very, thank you. These variables at each site uh, can take on two values, plus one and minus one. Uh, in the physics literature, this is often called an easing model, but um, uh, that's simply a matter of terminology. Now, uh, 
there is an energy that we will associate. This H is called a Hamiltonian, but it, you can think of it as an energy of the for every single configuration, for every realization of the plus ones and minus ones at each side, there will be an energy associated with it that is given by this summation here where this indicates that x and y are nearest neighbors on the lattice ZD. These JXYs are called couplings between the binary variables at nearest neighbor sites x and y. And right now I will leave these undefined. I will tell you what they are. Momentarily. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, am I, am I, you know, uh, Eugene Lindner once said that the speaker has many fine qualities, but he's not transparent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so the, uh, what we're going to look at is an initial configuration. So I want you to think about this as a dynamical process. Uh, evolving in time. At time zero, we're going to choose the binary variables. Sometimes I will call them spins because that goes back to the physics terminology. But spins means at each side there is a binary variable that can take on the values plus or minus one. So each of these spins will be chosen independently of all the others with equal probability plus or minus one, the flip of a fair coin. In thermodynamics, that would correspond to an infinite temperature configuration. Everything is completely uncorrelated with everything else, and the energy function doesn't matter. And then what we're going to let it do is evolve according to this energy function. So basically, that corresponds to a quench from infinite to zero temperature instantaneously. So the way we're going to define the dynamics, again, uh, these JXYs are given in some way. I haven't said what they are yet, but just assume for the moment that they are they're, they're fixed and given. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to attach to each of these binary variables a Poisson clock with rate one. And each Poisson clock is independent, so a spin at a particular site, its Poisson clock goes mm -hmm. off. And what it does is it looks around at its neighbors and it calculates its energy. And this is the energy change if the spin flips, if it goes from plus one to minus one or vice versa, okay? According to that energy function or Hamiltonian that I described earlier. And by the way, if anything is unclear, then please stop me at any point. I'll be happy to answer. Um, okay, so this represents the energy change if the spin flips. And the algorithm that the spin follows is very simple. If the energy is lowered, if delta Hx is less than zero by spin flip, then it does it with probability one. If the energy is raised, then it does not do it. It flips with probability zero. And if there's a tie, if there is zero energy change, if delta Hx is zero, then one again flips a fair coin. And if it comes up heads, it flips. If it comes up tails, it does not flip. Okay, so there's two sources of randomness in the problem so far. There is the initial spin configuration, which is cho chosen from a you know, symmetric Bernoulli distribution. And then there is, I will denote by omega, the dynamics. The dynamics is also a source of randomness. There's two sources of randomness in the dynamics. There is the order in which the Poisson clocks ring. And then, of course, if there's a tie, in certain models there may be, in others there won't be, but if there's a tie, then of course there's the outcome of the coin flip. So that's a dynamics, and this is a zero temperature dynamics. Basically what this is saying, physically, is that the energy will always run downhill, which is what happens at zero temperature. It just wants to lower the energy. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're starting from an infinite temperature configuration and then applying a zero temperature dynamics. So that's why this is the application of infinite to zero temperature of very deep quench. Okay, is, is that clear to everybody? Good. Okay, so I guess I need to say, uh, <coughs> uh, I said that already, I guess I need to say a little bit about the, the, the couplings, but before I do that, uh, let me show you a, a simulation on the web. I used to have better ones, but this is the best I could do now. So this, uh, so here the, the dark, let's say represents minus one, the up represents plus one. This uh, basically, basically what, this looks like it has been going on for a little time, but what you see is that basically these boundaries want to straighten out because that tends to lower the energy. And these little 
loops of plus one in these minus one regions are going to decrease right, until they're zero. And then basically what's going to happen is that one or the other of these will take over eventually the entire lattice, although sometimes one might get a stripe of one in the other. So, oh, there it is. So, so that's just a, uh, a dynamical um, uh, manifestation. Yeah, might as well just get rid of it entirely. And now let's get back to our talk. So, whoops, have to wait a second. Ah, it's always a danger when you do that. You never know what's going to happen, what makes it fun. Okay, um, so there's two questions that we need to ask. The first is that, again, given the, uh, some fixed set of couplings chosen in some way, which I'll get to in a second, um, we want to ask the following question. If, uh, given a particular uh, sigma naught and omega, uh, what happens? And then in particular, we want to ask for almost every initial <coughs> condition sigma naught and almost every dynamical realization omega, does the infinite time limit of the uh, configuration, of the spin configuration, as a function of the initial condition and uh, the dynamic realization exists. Or probably a better way of saying this, take a particular spin arbitrarily. Does that spin with probability greater than zero flip finitely many times? Or does it flip infinitely many times? If every spin flips finitely many times, then we say that there is an infinite time limit. Right, at, every, at any given time, it could be that there are some spins that haven't finished flipping, but every spin after a certain time will have stopped flipping. Okay? It could be <coughs> that some spins flip finitely many times and others flip infinitely many times. It could be that every spin flips finitely many times, or it could be that no spin flips finitely many times. Everything flips infinitely many times. And uh, so that's the first question we have to ask for a particular model. And the second thing goes to the heart of the title of the talk, which is, as the time gets large, to what extent? So this sigma t represents the configuration of all of the binary variables or the spins at a given time t, given an initial configuration and a dynamical realization. To what extent does the spin configuration at a time t depend on the initial conditions, that is, what we call nature, and to what extent does it depend on the dynamical realization, that is nurture? This is from the famous nature versus nurture problem in biology, right? How much of who you are depends on your DNA, your initial conditions, and how much depends on your life history, your dynamical realization. So that's what we want to ask. Now this is phrased very vaguely, okay? This should not satisfy a mathematics audience. I will, um, I, I will make this more precise momentarily, but I can't really do that without resolving this question first for a particular model because whether uh, how one phrases this really depends on whether every spin flips only finitely many times or infinitely often or somewhere in between. Okay, now finally, let me talk about the couplings. So there's two kinds of models we're going to consider. One is where all of those couplings that determine the energy between nearest neighbor spin is simply equal to plus one. It's called, this is in physics corresponds to what's called a uniform ferromagnet. What that means is that every pair of spins has the lowest energy if they're parallel, right? If they're, if they're all plus one or all minus one. So here there's two lowest energy or ground states, everything plus one or everything minus one. Okay, that's the a uniform or homogeneous ferromagnet. Then there's another kind of model, and I hope this isn't too low for people to see. Can everybody see this okay? Okay. There's another model in which uh, there's a third source of randomness, and that's in the couplings. The third, I'm sorry, the second kind of model is where the couplings, the JXYs, are chosen from an independent product measure of some probability measure on the real line. Typically, we'll take that to be the normal distribution. So basically, in that case, these couplings are IID random variables, each chosen from a normal distribution, say with mean zero and variance one. That is the case of something in physics called the spin glass. It's a very interesting model of disordered systems, but we don't need to worry about that here. We're more interested in the mathematical question of how these spins dynamically evolve and how much information gets carried forward in time. All right, so that's the problem that we're going to look at. Everything 
Clear so far? Good. Okay. Now let's look at the simplest case. The simplest case is one dimension, so you just have a bunch of binary variables on a line with nearest neighbor couplings. And let's consider the case of the homogeneous ferromagnet. So this is the simplest model that one can think of. You have a bunch of binary variables at, at, at lattice sites on Z, uh, that is at, at each integer Z. Uh, each one can be plus one or minus one. The lowest energy is where everything is the same, everything plus one or everything minus one, okay? And there is a theorem that goes way back to 30 years ago to Rodia and Cox uh, Griffith that says for the D equals one homogeneous ferromagnet, every spin flips infinitely often, okay? And the proof of that is very simple. I will just quickly summarize it here, and I guess, Mike, just so I know, I guess I should stop at 9.35, so there's five minutes for questions, because I see I go oh. from 9 to 9.40, is that about right? That'd be fine, or you can leave no time for questions. Your choice. <laughs> <laughs> how, how do you feel about that? Well, I'll try to leave some time for questions. Okay, the proof of this is fairly simple. Just rather, rather quickly going over it, basically, um, you, you take a look at, so, 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 um, so you have, uh, so basically, uh, these sigma naught and the omega, the initial condition of the dynamical realization, are chosen from translation ergodic distributions. And you have a, a symmetry in the problem, which is that, you know, the probability of any spin being plus one or minus one is equally probable. So you have a, 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 a symmetry under uh, reflections. Uh, sigma naught goes to minus sigma naught. And then you have translation invariance of quantities such as the fraction of spins that end up in a final state. So given all that, basically the probability that the spin, you, you put all that together and you get that the probability that a spin at a given site flips finitely many times and ends up as plus one must be equal to the probability that it flips finitely many times and has a final state of minus one. And we'll call that probability P. If P is zero, then every spin flips infinitely often P obviously can't be greater than a half. Um, if P is strictly positive, then at least some spins flip finitely often. And now, uh, this is, this is um, uh, I, let, let me phrase this a little bit more, more simply. So basically, the way to think about this is the following. Um, this is sort of a fancy way of saying the following thing. Let's suppose that, uh, let's say that there's a positive probability that every spin flips finitely often. Then it must be the case, since the probability that a spin ends up as plus one is equal to that, that it's equal to minus one, it must be the case that you will have um, some domain, say, of plus spins that are surrounded by minus spins, okay? And now, if that is the case, then, and, and, and that has to be true after some time, and that must never change. If that is the case, then it must be true that there is, that any um, domain wall inside where spins are, uh, spins are still flipping inside can never leave that region. But that can't be the case, you can show just given the dynamics, that it must be the case that any fluctuating, any moving domain wall, domain wall simply means a boundary between a plus one and minus one, cannot be confined to any finite region uh, with positive probability. That with any probability greater than zero, it must leave that region, which leads to a contradiction and hence the result. So it's very simple in one dimension, uh, but so, so the conclusion is that in one dimension on the line with the uniform ferromagnet, uh, every spin flips infinitely often. But what about higher dimensions? That's a more uh, interesting case. So back in 2000, um, Chuck and I, with Chuck's graduate student, uh, Seema Nanda, proved that in two dimensions, the same situation, the homogeneous ferromagnet, every coupling equal to plus one, every spin, again, flips infinitely often for almost every initial condition and coupling realization. And the proof of that is similar to the 1D proof. It's a little bit more complicated. There you take a square, and you have to show that any domain wall within the square uh, and in order for things to flip finitely off, and that domain wall can never leave the square, and then you show that that cannot occur uh, with any positive probability. 
So we know the answer in one and two dimensions for the ferromagnet, and now the question is, what about higher dimensions? Well, that remains open. Uh, we've been unable to prove anything in B equals three and higher simply because the geometry of the kinds of possible final configurations gets too complicated. There is some numerical work that's pretty old due to Stauffer that seems to suggest that in three and four dimensions, it's like one and two, every spin flips infinitely often, and then five dimensions and above, it's no longer true. But we have no idea whether that, in fact, is true or not. That's simply based on some rather rough numerical work. OK, so, um, so here, every spin flips infinitely often. And now we want to ask the question of, given an initial condition, how much can one predict about what the spin configuration looks like at a later time? And I'll return to that for the case of homogeneous using ferromagnets. But first, let me now consider the second class of systems I've spoken about, namely these disordered models where the couplings are chosen from uh, an, uh, are chosen from IID. The couplings are IID random variables chosen from a normal distribution. Okay, it turns out, <clears throat> this may be hard to believe, but it turns out that this case is in fact simpler than the case of the homogeneous ferromagnet. So here the couplings, the nearest neighbor couplings, are chosen from the independent product measure of some probability measure on the real line. For simplicity, we'll usually take it to be Gaussian mean zero and variance one, but um, it could be more general than that, so we'll let mu denote that measure. And then this theorem that appeared in the paper of Newman, uh, then the Newman Stein says that if mu has finite mean, then for almost every, now almost every coupling realization, almost every initial condition, almost every dynamical realization, and for every x, there are only finitely many flips of every spin that result in a non-zero energy change. Okay? Now, in fact, this is a this is a, saying it a bit too strongly. In fact, one could put weaker conditions on there. Some cases, in fact, where mu has infinite mean and one can prove the same result, but it's not going to be relevant for anything I have to say, so let's ignore that. So what does that mean? What that means is that in any dimension at all, if you have a spin lattice, that is, these binary variables in every side in ZD, and you have continuous coupling disorder, say, near uh, couplings that are chosen from a normal distribution, IID random variables, then every spin flips finitely often. There is a limiting spin configuration. And that's true in any dimension. Okay? Uh, in fact, what this really says, it, 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 this is a bit stronger. This says even for the ferromagnet, even for the case when all of the J's are the same, that there are only a finite number of energy lowering flips that every spin can make. What that means is that the reason why the ferromagnet, why you know every Jx equaling plus one, why that system, every spin flips infinitely often in one and two dimensions, <coughs> what that means is that every spin, only finitely many of those spin flips lower the energy. The reason why they flip infinitely often is because you have these zero energy changes, these ties, and you have an infinite number of zero energy flips. That's what's making them flip forever. So in fact, that also means that if I have something like a model not on ZD, say a hexagonal lattice or a triangular lattice in two dimensions or in higher dimensions, in solid state physics, things called a face-centered cubic lattice or body-centered cubic, in any dimension, even if I have a homogeneous ferromagnet, but each side has an odd number of neighbors, then once again, there can be no ties. And once again, every spin flips finitely often. OK, so we have a wide variety of models now um, where, where we know the answer. Oh, I guess I said I, I will provide the proof of this in one dimension where things are simple. And in fact, this is, rather an, oops, this is rather an interesting case to take a look at. So let me uh, talk about that. So let's think about what's happening in one dimension, because this will then get us to the question of predictability as well. And so suppose I have a continuous coupling distribution in one dimension. What that means is that there will be a number of couplings, a number of edges that have a coupling associated with them, where that edge has a greater coupling magnitude. The magnitude is greater than the edge on either side. Okay, we're going to call those bully bonds because what that means is that if I think about it for a second, if I have a coupling whose magnitude is larger than 
the couplings on either side, once that coupling is satisfied, it will stay satisfied forever. Because I can never lower the energy by flipping one of the spins on either end. It will always be raised if I do that. So once that's satisfied, it stays satisfied forever. So basically, consider two neighboring bully bonds, okay, or couplings, and then in between there will be something that will have, that will be smaller than, uh, there was coupling magnitude will be smaller than on either side, okay? And so basically, each of these, a, a particular bully bond basically will have a cascade of influence going down to the, the, the sissy or weak bonds uh, on either end. Basically, every spin that's in that cascade of influence, final value will be determined by that bully bond. All right? And so, and so now we can talk about the question of predictability because, um, so, so basically what, what's going to happen, so we know that every spin flips finitely often because the bully bond, you know, after some small number of flips is going to be satisfied with probability one. And once it's satisfied, every spin within its uh, domain of influence, that is in the region going down to the weak bonds on either side, will be satisfied according to, right, once, it, once that's satisfied, then there's a cascade as each successive plus on clock rings of the spins on either side, they'll be satisfied, and then they'll stay satisfied forever until I get down to those weak bonds. And the only couplings in the final state whose, um, who, whose couplings can be unsatisfied, that is, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a plus coupling whose spins could be anti-parallel so that its energy is high, will be those weak bonds. Um, so now let me, uh, now let's make more clear what we mean by predictability. So we're going to define an order parameter uh, where this order parameter at a time t is basically what, I, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the average of a spin at the side x averaged over all, uh, at a time t, averaged over all dynamical realizations. Okay, and we take the square of that and then we average that over all spins. And that's the same as taking that same average over dynamical realizations and squaring it and averaging over all um, couplings, if there's disorder in the couplings, and over all initial configurations. Now, of course, the reason why we have to square it is that, you know, even if everything eventually stops, some will be plus, some will be minus, and you'll get zero, so you want to square it. So what this is saying is the following. This is saying that I have a, I, I have a, um, a spin and a particular dynamical realization. Well, we're looking at systems now for the moment where everything flips finitely many times. It'll stop after a certain amount of time. That's in one dynamical realization. But then I look over all dynamical realizations and I want to know how often it ends up as plus one and how often it ends up as minus one. I average over those and then I square the results. So I look at each spin and average over all dynamical realizations. So clearly when t equals zero, this is one because the dynamics hasn't started yet. If this is zero as time goes to infinity, and that's what we call QD, the limit of this as time goes to infinity. If this is zero as time goes to infinity, that means that the initial configuration has no influence on the final state. The dynamics determines everything. It's all nurture and no nature. Whereas if Q sub D is strictly greater than zero, that means that the initial condition does have some influence on what the final state is. And the magnitude of QD tells you to what extent the um, uh, initial condition uh, influences the final state. Well, so it turns out that in one dimension we can calculate this exactly. It turns out that QD is a half, meaning that uh, exactly uh, half of all of the final states of the spins will have been directly determined by the initial condition, and exactly half will have been determined by the dynamics. And the reason is simple to see. Because all you really have to think about is the bully bonds, because then once they're satisfied, every other, that determines what every other spin in their domain of influence would be. And so, basically, in the initial condition, Chuck? Exactly. It may not be clear to most people why this has anything to do with predictability. 
Oh, I thought I, I thought I said that it, it tells you exactly how much is told the initial condition. You said that, but I don't think it's clear why that's the case. Don't you need to mention about identical twins or what? About identical twins? And no, well, I'm going to get to identical twins when we talk about the numerical results. But you know, how, how, how do you see that that has anything to do with? Why is that? No, right no, there? no. It, it, okay, you don't need to talk about. I mean, ident you, you can talk about identical twins. You can. Say if I take two, if you take two initial conditions, two initial conditions, and you let them evolve according to different dynamics, you know what's what's the uh, probability that the two of them will end up in the same state? So that's one way of looking at it. But you don't, I mean, you don't have to talk about identical twins. Basically, this is saying that how many, if I look at every possible dynamical realization given an initial state. Um, how many dynamical realizations end up in the same place? If um, half of them end up with the spin up and half end up with the spin down, then that's telling you that the dynamical realization is determining everything. But if, say, three quarters of the dynamical realizations end up with the spin up and one quarter end up with it down, then given the initial symmetry in the problem, that's telling you that the initial state had to have some influence on what happened later on. So, you know, so you can, so we'll, we'll talk about identical twins when we get to the numerical analysis, and that's a perfectly fine way to think about it, but you don't have to talk about it. Oh, anyway, getting back to why QD is a half is um, simply because in the initial, so I said everything depends on the bully bonds. Well, in the initial configuration, um, there's a probability one half that a bully bond will already have been satisfied which means that every spin in its domain of influence will already be satisfied. That means that the initial configuration has determined what the final state is of every spin within that domain of influence. Then there's a probability of half that that bully bond is not satisfied, and so half the dynamical realizations will have it um, satisfied one way, and the other half of the dynamical realizations will have it satisfied the other way, so that there, the dynamics determines everything, and the initial condition determines nothing. So, um, so that's why half of the, um, that's why QD is a half for the 1D chain. That says that for every spin, well, if I take a spin at random, then with probability of half, its final state was determined by the initial condition, and the probability of half, it was determined by the dynamics. Okay, I, I need to get to our, um, our, our numerical simulation. So now I wanna talk about so, so that's, the, that's 1D. Now what about when sigma infinity does not exist? Well, what you can do there is you can, you can look at, so, so when this does not exist, that means that every spin configuration, um, you know, every spin flips infinitely often, so that never settles down. But one can also do an average over the dynamics and ask whether this averaged measure settles down. Now that might settle down and it might not. And there's two possible cases. One is that even though every spin configuration uh, does not settle down for almost every coupling realization, or if, if, if this is disordered, and sigma naught and omega, then the average uh, dynamics does have a limit. And we call that weak local non-equilibration. But it could also be that even that dynamically averaged measure does not settle down. And in fact, this has been proved to exist for some systems, uh, in particular in this paper for um, border models, I think with asymmetric rates, I believe, something like that. So uh, it could happen that the dynamically average measure does settle down or doesn't settle down. If it doesn't settle down, then we have something called chaotic size dependence. It turns out that this case actually has more predictability than this case, because if this does have a limit, that basically what that's telling you is that the dynamics basically has averaged over everything so that the dynamically averaged measure has settled down. Whereas if the, there is no limit at all, that means that even the dynamically averaged measure is changing. And that means also that some regions will be in excess of plus spins in the initial condition that will lead it to be plus one after a certain time and minus one later on, uh, and so on, which means that there is some remnant of predictability left. 
So what one can do here, basically, is to simply look, not look at the infinite limit of Q, sub QT, but simply look at how it decays in time. So now let me turn to numerical work and, uh, and ask about what we've learned. So, so we don't know what happens yet in the 2D ferromagnet, so we have to do that numerically. This we did in collaboration with John Macta and Jing Yi. So here we have the homogeneous ferromagnet in um, two dimensions. And um, about a third of the time, two thirds of the time, you'll end up in the all plus one or all minus one state in a finite volume. And roughly one third of the time, you'll get these strike states where, say, this is minus one and these are plus ones. So those are the possibilities. So basically, now I can talk about twins. So what we did here to distinguish the effects of nature versus nurture is that we simulated a pair of easing lattices with identical initial conditions. We call those twins. And we let them then evolve according to different randomly chosen dynamics. So this is like identical twins separated at birth and never talking to each other. And then you see how much they're alike uh, a time t later. By the way, this is the opposite of something called damage spreading. Damage spreading is an old problem that does the exact opposite. There it takes two initial configurations that are slightly different and lets them evolve according to the same dynamical realization and sees how much the damage or the difference has spread in time t. Okay, so there's two things that we want to look at. One, so, so this is the, uh, basically the measure of similarness between the two different twins, the, uh, the two copies after a time t. And now we, of course, have to have a sense of function of L, the size of the lattice that we're looking at. And we're interested in two things. We're interested in what happens if you first take the limit as L goes to infinity and then t goes to infinity. So you're looking how this Q of t, this measure of similarity or overlap <coughs> decays with time t. And then the other thing that you're looking at is first you take the limit as t goes to infinity and then L goes to infinity. So you want to look at the L dependence of uh, this quantity after you've let it stop and you measure a certain overlap. Is N uh, capital L squared? N is capital L squared. I'm sorry. Do I have an N somewhere? Okay, the, the, the display equation of both N and L. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just thank you. Never noticed that. Yes, <laughs> N is L squared. L is the size of the lattice. Um, okay. So we looked at 21 lattice sizes from L equals 10 to 500. And for each size, we studied 30,000 independent trials of these twins to see what happens. So here's the first set of graphs. So these are for different lattice sizes from 20 to 500. And what you see is you see a universal curve they all fall in. Everything decays rapidly initially, and then it levels out. And then, of course, they, there will be a finite overlap after time t, because these are, after all, finite lattices. But you see that as L gets larger, the overlap gets smaller and smaller. And so it's natural to expect that this universal curve that everything is falling on is the L goes to infinity limit, the time decay of QT for the L goes to infinity limit. And one can fit this. What, so the first conclusion that we found is that this does decay, and it decays as a power law, which is interesting because we, physicists love power laws. Um, but it also tells you that uh, there's, uh, there's no intrinsic time scales in the problem. So we uh, measure this to a power law fit, what we call the status of H, the heritability exponent. And we found that theta H for the 2D ferromagnet was roughly 0.22. Next, we looked at the, let me go back for a second. So next, we looked at the, basically how these decay as a function of L, right? There's 30 values for L equals 20, 50, and so on. So how does this decay as a function of L? So that's the next plot. And you see that these fit a power law. This is a log log plot. So these fit a power law very well, too. And we found that Q infinity of L decays as L to the minus 0.46. Now, it turns out that you can relate these two by a simple finite size scaling ensembles. This is, this is very non-rigorous. It's a simple scaling argument that we often use in physics. So we use the fact that, one, first of all, we know that in the 2D ferromagnet, the typical domain size grows as a square root of t. 
All right, if you look at a domain of all plus ones or all minus ones, and you ask how that grows with time, after a certain time, not initially, but after a long time, they tend to grow as the square root of the time. It's sort of like a random walk process. So then given that, and given the fact that we know that these de decay as power laws, either way that we uh, take the limits, we write this as in a typical scaling form as t to the minus theta sub h times a function of this combined variable that has to behave uh, in this uniform way, in this joint way. And in order to um, match up to what we know, we know that if you take the L goes to infinity limit first, so that this gives, um, you know, F, this gives zero in here, that this has to go to a constant that gives you the t to the minus h, as we discussed before. And then if you take the limit t goes to infinity first, then this has to scale as the argument raised to the power z theta h, so that you get this decays as L to the minus, um, uh, L to the minus z. And then using the fact that z equals 1 half, uh, you find that q infinity of L then decays as a power law in L, I'm sorry, not z, but z theta h. And given the fact that z is equal to, uh, z is equal to uh, 2 here, uh, that's right, z is 2, you get that the exponent, the decay of the um, L dependence is twice the heritability exponent, which in fact matches our results very well. So what we found so far is the following. For finite L, there are limiting absorbing states. The overlaps decay is a power law in L with P equals 0.46, and that um, as if you let L go to infinity first and you look at the time decay, and you know, let L go to infinity, then T go to infinity, you get this power law decay T to the minus theta H, which theta H equals 0.22. And the finite size scaling ansatz suggests that this should be twice this, which in fact is consistent with our numerical results within uh, the, um, the errors of the, uh, within, within the numerical errors. The other thing that we found is that since theta h is um, greater than zero, it displays weak L and E, but theta h is small, so the information about the initial state decays slowly. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to skip the rest of this and just get to the conclusion. So, so basically, um, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about persistence. I just want to say that we have been continuing what we've been doing. Um, uh, Jing Yi has been working on this uh, down to Princeton. And we've been looking at what happens, what QD is for disordered models in higher dimension. Remember we found it in one dimension where it was a half. And what she seems to be finding numerically is that QD seems to be decaying, as you'd expect, as dimension gets higher. She saw it for 2, 3, and 4. And in four dimensions, it's down to about 0.3. What looks to be happening is that it does not seem to be going to zero as D goes to infinity, but it seems to be sort of leveling out. We really are sure at this point whether that is in fact what happens or whether it should, this heritability, um, you know, the uh, nature versus nurture, whether this really does go to zero as D goes to infinity. So we're trying to work on this analytically. We have a graduate student, Dan Jenkins, who's been working on this. Right now, we really don't know the answer. So that's where we are at the moment. We've been able to analyze some cases. There's some other cases that we're looking at, and it's still in a very much a state of flux. So I will stop here, and I hope this time for at least for a couple of questions. Any questions? I have a question. Wait, oh, no, there's one. Go ahead. Yeah, so at the beginning, you, you introduced the H. So what is the John distribution of sigma A? It's not what I'm is sorry? John, what is the John density function of those sigma H? John density function of sigma A. Well, well, the, well, the sigma x, they're, they're dependent variables. You have, a, yeah, you, have, yeah. you, have, right, you have a distribution of the initial conditions uh -huh. and of the, um, of the dynamics, okay? And then the, you know, what the sigma x does is determined by those. So, so those, are, you know, those are just uh, the, the initial conditions just independent for newly, and then the dynamics are you know, Poisson uh, distribution, okay? okay? But, but the sigmas themselves, uh, are not chosen according to a distribution. They're dynamical variables that evolve according to the energy function. Okay, okay? does that clarify that? Mm -hmm. okay. Right.
What happens if you replace lattice by tree? By, ah, by so, another tree? So, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, what does happen with the tree? So, yeah, so, uh, yeah, this is a good question. Uh, so, if, if the, so take, a, take a homogeneous tree uh, with, say, uh, uh, Q, uh, Q neighbors. Q, every site has Q neighbors. If Q is odd, then by some version of the theorem that was mentioned before, uh, because you don't have any ties, I'm talking about the, uh, right, the homogeneous you, system, yeah. you simply want to agree with the majority of the neighbors, uh, then everything will uh, you know, stop changing. Right, that's the same case as when you have a lattice, a Euclidean lattice with an odd number of neighbors. There's no difference uh, right. for that. Uh, yes. But uh, so the, uh, the most interesting case, there are questions there. The most interesting case, if you start with a symmetric distribution, is a tree with an even number of neighbors, like the four tree. Every site has four neighbors. And there the answer is not known. Uh, so uh, there's a partial result, uh, the partial result, uh, which has been gotten independently by various people. Uh, if, if there are uh, some sites which uh, stop flipping, then there also will be some sites that flip forever. Because basically, because look at, say, the origin, uh, if one if 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 one of its neighbors uh, stops slipping and ends up being plus, then you can show that of the four neighbors, it will there will be a positive probability that two end up stop flipping and being plus, and two end up stop flipping and being minus. But in that case, the origin will always flip because it, there's always a tie, so it just will flip forever. So either either uh, everything flips forever, or else. Some things stop flipping and some things continue flipping, and it's not known which is the case. I, I was, that's a very nice problem. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, um, there are other cases known where you have this sort of mixed situation where some spins stop flipping and others flip forever. Uh, with um, Alberto Gandalfi, uh, Chuck and I, and Alberto proved that for something called a plus minus J model, where now each coupling is chosen to be either plus one or minus one with equal probability in their IID random variables. In that case, uh, in two dimensions, you have a mixed result where some spins stop flipping and others flip in from the real So there are cases where that's known. Chuck mentioned one, that's another one. Uh, what happens in higher dimensions for that too is not known. So yeah, it, it, there's a lot of open problems here. Mike, you have a question? I'll defer to anybody else if they have. When you're doing the overlap, uh, you fix the L and let T go to infinity, or the other way around, fix T that. Right, well, there's the two different cases we yeah. So, what if you let L go to infinity with T? We two haven't two. done, I mean, what, what happens, well, we certainly haven't done that in America. Yeah. We simply fixed one, and then, yeah. well, of course, letting it go to infinity. We didn't really do that. We sort right. of did the numerical equivalent of that. Yeah. But we haven't looked at what happens when the two go to infinity in some, you know, in some relation. That's, that's another interesting question that um, okay. I, I can make guesses, but it's probably, oh, okay. it probably isn't worth much. So, okay. Anything else? Well, let's thank that again for a very. <laughs>